This week on ACT OUT, in a 4th of July special, we take a look at what America is. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The real shit and the real people fighting and building beyond the confines of a capitalist empire. Then we'll wrap it all up in a firework musing that goes quite well with sparklers and watermelon. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. So as you're watching this, it's either July 4th or just after. And so it seemed an apt time to reflect on what makes us America, a mirror reflection of our reality, as covered and seen on this show. So without further ado, welcome to America. Profit from pain. It's the American way. At least officially, but unofficially. And outside the narrow lens of corporatized media disaster porn, there are the Occupy Sandys. There are communities coming together to help each other. As Newsweek pointed out in their reporting from Katrina's aftermath, while government funding came with strings attached, political motivations and top-down approach Thousands of volunteers focused instead on fixing the city one issue at a time, side by side with the resident they had come to help. And as Scott put it, what we have really seen in modern society is that we need decentralized disaster relief. That smaller groups of people, autonomous communities, can actually be first responders and actually build for the longer term without larger governments or things like Red Cross. So, like in Houston just the other day, we saw people of all political persuasions that might not agree, that might be in the streets arguing with each other around a political campaign. They were all doing the same thing. There were hundreds of boats from people from rural communities and fishing communities who were waiting to get in. And you also had anarchists on the ground who were doing distribution of food and water in very limited supplies while the city was still absolutely flooded. The charity industrial complex will not save us from the worst effects of climate change or indeed the human disasters designed by capitalism that follow. And for good reason. The charity industry is built into capitalism, a pressure valve to keep this obese machine grinding us through its gears while the media play us a lullaby. Be it Katrina, Sandy, Harvey, or whatever benignly named disasters are to come, put your money and your action towards locals, the people on the ground that know what they need because they're living it. So the DACA program had flaws from the very beginning. The fact that it was launched right around the re-election, right, uh, right, right around the election talks, specifically to dismiss Obama's catastrophic over two, over two million deportations. At the, at the end of the day, you can tell me that you're protecting the children all that you can, but you're deporting our parents. And you're deporting us as soon as we're old enough to not be seen as children. <laughs> it's, it's literally the whole narrative was set just to make people believe that this is who we're fighting for, that this is who they are. They, they use us, that the imagery... They were using our images, they were using our bodies, they were using our narratives. At several points, they were using our stories. Well, and that's the other thing that, that you mentioned in, in, in the article that you wrote, that it's not about defending DACA, it's about defending each other. Talk a little bit about, uh, about that. What, what I mean when I say let's defend each other instead of defend DACA, I mean that you could spend days, weeks, months calling your politicians asking them, begging for help, and I would rather spend days, weeks, months asking each other how we can help each other. I would rather talk to each other and ask us, do you have a plan? What is going to happen now? What are you going to do? Because I'm sorry, I'm done begging for help, especially for the people, the very same government that is trying to kill us. It just seems ridiculous. I would rather invest in self-defense trainings, in food for our communities because feeding each other means defending ourselves because part of the fence, it means keeping each other alive. I would rather invest in each other, in ourselves, in our bonds and in our strength, you know? And um, 
I think that a lot of people get really caught up in defending DACA for the sake of defending DACA when they forget that the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program was from the very beginning, again, like it was established by a person that deported two mi that deported millions from our community. It was established by a corporation, a government that has continued to kill us and that set the borders that in the very first place displaced us from our communities. And I, I don't understand. It's like begging for help from your abuser. First off, this march was not organized by a lofty NGO without any connection to communities or people. This march was specifically organized by the people and the communities that it was about. No faceless, soulless, multi-million dollar organization. People. And therefore, secondly, the energy, the spirit, and again, the joy and power of this march highlighted that the point isn't always to saddle a march with the weight of changing the world, but instead with changing minds, changing hearts. As hippy dippy as it may sound, if you were there, you know, you could not possibly have left without feeling uplifted, inspired, and engaged. People had their eyes open and they saw black women marching next to indigenous women, connecting struggles and also joy, connecting music and, and dance. People saw the power and resolve of black women outside the Department of Justice, calling this system out for its racism, its patriarchy, its murders, and promising to never back down. People saw women lifting up women. They saw white folks showing up. They saw connections being made, networks being strengthened. They heard drummers and saw dancers. They felt something. And that something is the stuff that changes hearts and minds. That something is the shit that manufactures dissent, that brings people into the fight and keeps those in the fight going. Marches can do a lot. In 1982, the combined wealth of the Forbes 400 was $92 billion, or about $231 billion in today's dollars. That's less than the combined wealth of just the top three people on the Forbes list today. The combined wealth of the entire top 400 today adds up to 2.68 trillion, which is more than the GDP of Britain, the fifth largest economy in the world. That means that the 400 richest in the U.S. now have more wealth than the bottom 64% of Americans, or 80 million households, 204 million people. 400 equals 204 million people. Furthermore, the three richest people on the list, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Warren Buffett, now own more wealth than the entire bottom half of the American population combined. 160 million people. These numbers are ridiculous. But wait, because I'm not done yet. According to Forbes' own research, every person in the top 10 got at least $1 billion richer in the past year. And if you can believe it, a record 169 billionaires were too poor to make the cut. Just think about that sentence. I mean, I swear I'm going to burst a goddamn blood vessel before the show is over. 169 billionaires didn't make the cut to be on the list of the 400 most ridiculously, disgustingly, horrendously wealthy people in the country. Meanwhile, one in five U.S. households, over 19 percent, have zero or negative net worth. Known as underwater households, they often have no savings at all or owe more than they own, which of course means that as income inequality continues to rise, there's no safety net to fall back on. Indeed, roughly 46 percent of Americans say that they don't have enough money to cover a $400 emergency expense. Past the glitter of holiday shopping, we know that there is a deep systemic rot. Beyond the Windex windows of pristine storefronts sit underpaid workers hawking slave labor threads. Behind the well-ordered syntax of industry lie chasms and gaps, a fault line, a time bomb, a capitalist disaster, a disaster capitalism cataclysm, a mathematic certainty, a burden we keep, putting off and the cost just keeps growing, like the debt clock, but here we're talking lives, we're talking death. Capitalism kills, and with each passing moment, we grow it, we own it. The light at the end of this ticker tape tunnel is dim, and the for sale sign is bright. Who's buying? Do you see the light? According to federal data, between January 2010 and November 2017, the nation's natural gas transportation network leaked a total of 17.55 billion cubic feet of mostly methane gas. That's enough to heat 233,000 homes for an entire year. And it's got the same global warming potential as the carbon dioxide emitted from a large coal-fired power plant over the course of a year. 
Pipeline incidents took nearly 100 lives, injured close to 500 people, and forced the evacuation of thousands, while costing about $1.1 billion. And every last one of those 100 people would still be alive. Those 500 people wouldn't be suffering from injuries, those billions of cubic feet would not be polluting our air, and every last cent of that money could have been spent on anything else. And speaking of money, our next headline has to do with mining and a decision handed down by the EPA earlier this month that relieves mining companies of the responsibility of paying for their pollution. Citing an unnecessary burden to the mining industry, penis wrinkle Scott Pruitt made the announcement which essentially shifts more cleanup costs onto the shoulders of you and me, rather than the companies that pollute. Indeed, just between 2010 and 2014, the EPA spent $1.1 billion on cleanup work at abandoned hard rock mining and processing sites across the country. Under the Superfund Act of 1980, the EPA is supposed to force mining companies to prove that they have the financial ability to cover cleanup costs. But the follow-up never materialized. Under Obama, activists finally sued their way to a follow-through, which has now been reversed. Activists and their legal teams vow to take this to court, but in the meantime, Americans have paid and will continue to pay both the environmental and economic costs of these perpetuating industry handouts. To give you an idea of how much, the EPA estimates the backlog of cleanup costs for hard rock mines across the country at 20 to $54 billion. And according to the Toxic Release Inventory, metal mining is the nation's leading source of toxic pollutants, generating nearly 2 billion pounds a year of hazardous materials such as arsenic, mercury, lead, and cadmium. As Rachel Kahn of Amigos Bravos put it, pollution from mining activities has contaminated drinking water, poisoned streams, killed fish, and caused corrosion of our nation's infrastructure. The Trump administration's final rule ensures that the public and the environment will continue to pay the price of this pollution. What you think of as the border isn't really the border, it's more of like a marker for the beginning of the end of your rights plus 100 miles. These regulations actually date back to 1953 when the DOJ established this 100-mile border zone without any public comment or debate. Fast forward to today, and not only do we have 20 times the number of Border Patrol agents on the prowl, but the technology with which they now police those areas has obviously expanded as well. Now includes watch list and database systems, such as the Automated Targeting System Traveler Risk Assessment Program, advanced identification and tracking systems, including electronic passports, and intrusive technological schemes such as the virtual border fence and unmanned aerial vehicles, aka drones. With many of these technologies in the hands of private companies, there are powerful financial incentives for the continued militarization of the border zone. What? You mean people are making bank off of oppressing others? Well, I never. And considering that roughly two-thirds of the U.S. population lives within 100 miles of a U.S. land or coastal border, you, along with 200 million other Americans, are actually subject to federal border agents stopping, interrogating, and searching Americans on an everyday basis with absolutely no suspicion of wrongdoing, and often in ways that our Constitution does not permit. Plus drone surveillance. Because uh, America. And because money. Makes you feel a lot safer, doesn't it? Of course not. And that's just the point. It's not supposed to make you feel safe. It's supposed to make you feel scared. Scared to live outside the confines of the dutiful prole who works and consumes and works and consumes. And it sure as shit is designed to make you fear dissent in any form or fashion. But don't let it. Don't let their fascist Orwellian moves freeze you. Don't let their cries of terrorism and safety quiet your drive to resist, build, and fight back. In November 2016, dozens of water protectors engaged in an action at a man camp just north of a Dapple Equipment Yard in North Dakota. Man camps is the name given to what Ann Manning mentioned in her article, the temporary housing for mostly out-of-state transient oil field workers, an example which you see here. The action focused not simply on the issue of oil projects, but rather what these projects and man camps bring into indigenous communities. Erica Gonzalez, a water protector who went to trial last week for participating in the action, said of her involvement, 
We wanted to have our ceremony there to raise awareness that wherever these pipelines come in, they bring these man camps, and then our women around the reservations go missing and are getting murdered or raped. The state doesn't do anything about it. I don't want to sugarcoat it. When they're raping our Mother Earth, they are also raping our women. While Gonzalez was acquitted on all charges, her comrades Rebecca Jesse and Roderick Joe were convicted of tampering with a public service, a Class C felony. The conviction was based on the fact that the action caused a 105-minute delay to a coal train bound for Minnesota. Although the train company, BNSF, suffered no substantial interruption or any financial loss, both Jesse and Joe received a 360 days deferred sentence with court fees and fines not to exceed the bond amount of $1,500 and with credit for two days of time already served. In more layman's terms, a deferred sentence is suspended until after a specified period of time, in this case 360 days. If they're not rearrested during that time, the charge can be dismissed and the conviction removed from their records. For their participation in an action calling attention to the rape, murder, assault, and disappearance of an untold number of indigenous women and girls, these two were made an example of. Meanwhile, the man camps remain, and coal, oil, and gas flow freely from a raped countryside into our water, our atmosphere, and our land in order to bolster Wall Street by any means necessary. Over 300 water protectors are still awaiting trial on state charges in North Dakota, and six are preparing for federal criminal trials. Line 3, as I mentioned, is on hold for the time being, with the June 2018 decision expected. The Minnesota Public Utilities Commission will have the final say about Line 3, and we urge these leaders to withdraw their consent from this destructive project and protect all we hold dear, Manning wrote. As has been said, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. None of us are free until all are free. My goal with Serve Your City is to uh, ensure that all white spaces are invaded. Um, that's our goal. Um, it's, it's important on so many levels. Um, I think our uh, segregation from one another is what leads to so many of our societal ills. That's one issue. Um, and the access issue, right? Um, not being able to access uh, quality programs and quality opportunities at a young age has such an impact upon um, your level of engagement in said activities as you grow up. I just want to be the bridge to ensure that the black and brown children that I serve um, get the same, not more, but just, just the same. Yeah. A New World Bank report estimates that by 2050, 140 million climate refugees will be migrating from areas ravaged by climate change. And that's apparently a conservative estimate. While the report focused on three areas in the quote-unquote developing world, the U.S., in our exceptional manner, already has climate refugees. Take that, World Bank. In southern Louisiana, the coastal indigenous community of Isle de Jean Charles is sinking. Well, it has been sinking for the last 90 years. When the band of Biloxi, Chirimacha, Choctaw Indians arrived in the early 1800s, they settled on the highest ridge in the area, located on... Isle de John Charles. In 1955, the isle, island measured 22,400 acres. Now only 320 acres remain. And while HUD offered some relocation grants to families on the island, the red tape only strengthened many of the locals' distrust in the government. A hundred people or less remain on the island, and as Louisiana's government continues to give the okay for more and more destruction to the wetlands, they'll likely be the last to ever live on the island before it entirely disappears. When I asked a woman in Puerto Rico if she thought any of the thousands of people would come back to the island, she ironically laughed. What would they come back to? And while Puerto Rico isn't disappearing into the ocean just yet, it certainly disappeared from the radar of U.S. empire interest. Not that it was ever really that present. Federal help isn't on the way for these communities, particularly as they are black, brown, and indigenous. Community help and solidarity, action from knowledge and engagement from giving a fuck are our tools, and we best get to sharpening them. Because despite our best efforts at recycling and foregoing cuddles for the sake of shorter showers, nature is dying. 
According to new studies produced by Nature Communications, trees in the tropical regions are dying twice as fast as they did 35 years ago, and four-fifths of the Earth's remaining woodlands are now in some way degraded by human activities. This figure, researchers warn, is probably an underestimate. Trees are vital to human survival due to their ability to mitigate warming and converting CO2 to oxygen. You know, something that we need to survive. Scientists call forests vital stabilizers in the fight to mitigate human-created climate change. And as James Watson of the University of Queensland and the World Conservation Society noted, Forest conservation must be prioritized based on their relative values, and Earth's remaining forests are the crown jewels, ones that global climate and biodiversity policies must now emphasize. As the spring thaw comes to Michigan, the Detroit Water and Sewage Department announced that they would be resuming mass water shutoffs, targeting more than 17,000 households. So these shutoffs have been ongoing since 2014, when the city declared bankruptcy, decimating workers' pensions and jobs. And between 2014 and 2017, Detroit saw more than one in seven of its 677,000 residents lose access to running water. How the fuck, you might ask? Well, as per usual, follow the money. Democratic Detroit Mayor Mike Dugan was backed primarily by billionaire real estate and entertainment moguls such as Dan Gilbert, founder and chairman of Quicken Loans, and the Illich family, owners of the Detroit Red Wings hockey team and Little Caesars Pizza. The brutal policy of water shutoffs flows out of arrangements put in place at the behest of these wealthy interests, with the collaboration of trade union leaders who agreed to sacrifice city workers' livelihoods and retirees' pensions as part of the bankruptcy deal. A key part of the bankruptcy settlement was plans to sell off or privatize city assets, including the lucrative DWSD. So, in the fall of 2014, the Great Lakes Water Authority was established in conjunction with the firing of hundreds of water department workers in a move to privatize Detroit's water. Soon after, the water, the water shutoffs began in order to make the balance sheet of the new water authority look, uh, you know, more attractive to investors, which is what always happens with privatization, because corporations, by law, care about bottom lines, public utilities, yeah, care about the public and utilities. And yet here it is, a grotesque and bloated corporate pus bag squeezing the poorest large city in the richest country in the world for water. Despite being right next to the world's largest fresh water supply, Detroit now pays more than two times the national average for water bills. No wonder people are falling behind. Similarly, Flint, Michigan, as we noted in last week's episode, is a mere half a, an hour and a half away from Nestle's bottling, bottling facility, which sucks fresh water from the spring in Everett, Michigan. Although that's the case, Flint pays 10 times more for its poisoned water than folks in Phoenix, Arizona, which you might know is in the middle of a fucking desert. Back in Detroit, the private contractors getting paid by the city to cut people's water at the street or indeed rip out water connections have just had their contract extended by Detroit City Council until 2021. In other words, Detroit is proud to pay goons to take people's water away rather than pay to ensure that people have access to water. Ladies and gents, capitalism. I don't want to leave on a low note, and I don't want to pretend that you can give hope a vote, because it's deeper than that. So as you head out or stay in to celebrate or not celebrate this day, whether you, like me, think that we'd all be better off without this capitalized, shrink-wrapped land of the free, consider this. This is not a happy birthday. No, this day is a hollowed pride and a long-standing genocide. This nationalist high made to conquer divide, glittering smoke screens that just barely hide the fact that America is not great. And it never was. For all wasn't meant to be for all, but for some. So why should you, why should I, put our hands over hearts and pledge allegiance to the legions still breaking the broken, old wounds aren't closing? Why saddle your soul with the empire's owed? We're owed more. And we owe more. 
We owe more to the early graves that were dug by our capitalist crusades. We owe more to the fighters and builders who've been whitewashed from history. We owe more to the kids coming up, growing up in smoke-filled air and poisoned soil. We owe our toil to more than a flimsy facade of freedom. And we, likewise, are owed more than a nation named, a constitution framed without us. Yes, the idea of America is not great either. And wait, just please pause, because pontificating platitudes just feed aggro attitudes. The theorizing keeps us from realizing that we can do better than a crusty old constitution, a resolution of, for, and by white land-owning men, 6% of the population back then and still today, it remains a pedestaled holy grail that we fail to see past the future of what we could be beyond the American dream. Because inside these walls of an empire dying, we can keep rising, we can aim higher than just getting by, and we can steal hope from a hangman's white rope. We can build dignity in the halls of a capitalist divinity. We can move past the blame game and masturbatory shame, the nihilistic, masochistic, fuck it all. No, feel with me. Wrap your shame in red, white, and blue. Set it on fire so that the feel-good warm pyre can bring us together to fight and to build. Let's make a sparkler out of our guilt and burn it like rites of passage. Yes, let's now move past this. Because we children of the empire are marked by our past and the last thing we need is a solemn silence for all of those deeds. A flag-waving passive devoid of the passion of fighting for liberation liberates oneself. Yeah, I want to be free, and my will to freedom is tied right to yours, bleeds over borders. Cue the requiem chorus for the empire's creed. It's the only independence you should raise a glass to, smashing the system in your mind, and be free. Free to be un-American. A child of empire that won't sit on sidelines, but stands on the front lines with hope and dignity. A human humility, a resolute, if not shaky, stability. The solidarity beyond a fake unity. Not for America, but for people and planet. Happy Independence Day. <laughs>